Mm-hmm. It is. Hello. <laughs> Woo! God, what a week. Whoa, this is standing ovation. <laughs> um, wow, what a week this has been. Honestly, what uh, the last 48 hours have been... I don't know. How how is everyone doing? Has everyone been following along with what's been happening with Nickelodeon specifically and Dan Schneider? I mean, this is wild. There are things coming out that I did not know. You know, so I'm I'm really learning also alongside everyone else. And it's just so wild because, you know, this was more than 17 years ago. And I have personally been waiting, feels like 17 years uh, for this type of validation. And I know that a lot of people can relate when it comes to having an experience that's not good. And, you know, no one was believing you at the time. If, if anything, actually, people were, you know, shaming you, um, just full of mistreatment. And then, you know, you're, you want to feel validated. You know, it really helps the healing process. Obviously, we can't, that's not always the case. You know, a lot of us have to go through the healing process without outside validation which makes it really hard, makes it really, really hard. And so this has just been, my younger self is feeling everything. And it's, I just honestly am in shock. I'm in shock, I'm in shock, I'm in shock. I don't know who has watched the first Nickelodeon protest that I did two years ago. Um, I'm, I'm curious who in the chat has seen it, but just wild how it's all coming full circle and how much I, you know, I was really trying to get the world to pay attention to what was happening behind the scenes when it came to Nickelodeon, you know, shows. Hi, Olivia, welcome to the dinner party. Welcome, so nice to have you here. You know, I was literally outside, you know, like face with a megaphone. <laughs> And, you know, trying to get Nickelodeon to acknowledge what we sadly had to endure working for their network, you know, and I knew they knew, right? But now we're here and there's a docu-series that is coming out in a few days, which is wild to think about. It's coming out on the 17th. And it is four parts. That's how much information there is. There's going to be four parts to this docu-series. And so many people came forward about their experiences. And it's really remarkable. It really is remarkable. And I do want to start this episode by saying, you know, um, wow. You, you all are so inspiring who took part in this documentary. Um, even Maxine Productions, who, you know, really helped, you know, facilitate this entire thing. And also Kate Taylor at Business Insider for really starting to dig originally into all of this and speaking with us in a way that felt very supportive and <laughs> quiets back. That wasn't the lizard. <laughs> if anyone was wondering, that was not the sound of the lizard um, in the studio. That was quiet. Um, but I just want to say thank you. And, and also thank you to every single person here who has been supporting, you know, us along this journey and 
you know, we need we need allies. We all need allies. We need good allies. And I just want to say thank you to all the allies out there. It really means a lot. We're going to be digging into a lot today. There is a lot to go through. Um, and it feels like it just keeps coming, honestly. It's just nonstop. Something every single day, something is being released. And my jaw is has been literally on the floor. It has been on the floor. And so we're going to go into the Hollywood Reporter article that came out where it goes into uh, in, in depth of the docuseries, what people have been saying about Dan Schneider, about Nickelodeon. We are also going to go into the letters. That's right. We're going to go into who wrote the letters um, in defense of Brian Peck which a lot of the people, you might know who they are. And when I started this journey, you know, you predators, it all started with trying to get the world to understand what institutional cover-up is, what it looks like, how it's happening in real time, and it has been a major major fuel, you know, for e-predators, because I have had my own personal experiences, sadly, when it comes to institutional cover-up. And what I have personally learned as a survivor is, yes, you know, the predators do need to be held accountable. And also, though, people who enable Predators, people who create safe havens for them, people who protect them must also be held accountable. They play actually a huge role in all of this. They really, really do. And it's time that we really understand that that is an actual thing and how it is harmful to the victim and we have to be better and we have to learn um, you know, as much information as we possibly can when we are bystanders and how to be a good bystander. What does that mean? Because there are a lot of not so good bystanders and then you got people actually enabling and protecting. And so what's really phenomenal and just horrific for me personally, as of late, are these letters. These letters that were sent in open court to a judge defending Brian Peck. And I think we all remember Danny Masterson, Ashton Kutcher, you know, Mila Kunis, and all of the very well-known names that wrote letters to the judge in defense of Danny Masterson. And where is Danny Masterson now, right? Horrible. And that was honestly, I think, the first time that a lot of people were seeing how Hollywood enables predatory behavior. I mean, they write letters, letters in defense for our words, keywords. You know, this is a reality. And you have to think how many survivors out there, and this is outside of Hollywood, right? This also goes outside of Hollywood. How many survivors come forward and no one's on their side? No one. No one. They stand there a lot of the time alone. And not only do they have to stand there alone, they have to watch people protect the person who harmed them. And that's a reality, and that goes outside of Hollywood. That's everywhere. I think that can be relatable for everybody as a survivor. So these letters were very upsetting. And I know that the last episode I did was on Tuesday and we were talking about Pizzagate. No, I'm okay. we, Well, we were talking about Pizzagate. 
<laughs> um, but we were talking about um, the, the pod meets world. And, you know, the reason why now I can say this here, the reason also why that was so deeply upsetting, that podcast episode, was because for me personally, we all knew these letters were about to emer like come out. They knew that. They knew that. And they said, you know, they started the episode, we're going to be honest and, you know, this and this and that. What I, what I found weird about that was that they were acting as if they were just bringing up Brian Peck because he was part of Boy Meets World. As if like, oh, this is just another episode. We, 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 we talk about everybody who's on, you know, the show and we go through it and now it's Brian Peck. No. No. It was because they were aware that these letters are coming out. Now, you have to remember these letters have been not sealed, but no one had access to these until the documentary. No one. And so a lot of these people never thought probably in a million years, in a million years, that these letters were going to come out. And what I found very disappointing and honestly made me really upset was that they chose to do a podcast episode first before reaching out to the victim and apologizing. You know, if they're so good at writing letters, you know, where's the letter for the victim? I wonder if they're writing one right now. I sure hope so. I hope they're spending their day today writing a serious letter, an apology, and also an apology for that podcast episode. I really do. Because how that episode rolled out was cringy. Didn't feel good as a survivor, and we need better allies than that. And, you know, these people knew. You know, from what I'm hearing, Brian Peck, like, told people, you know, oh, this happened, yeah. And in these letters, they refer to Drake Bell as, like, a young uh, man, young guy. He was a child. He was a child. And, and then one of the individuals that wrote a letter, which we're going to get into, is freaking Rich whatever his name is who was a huge part of Nickelodeon and went on to Disney and did The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, which now I'm starting to connect dots and, you know, be, you know, questions are emerging for me. You know, I always wondered, how did Brian Peck end up at Disney? And you know what, Rich? I hope Rich gets sent this. You know what you said, Rich, in your letter is you said that <laughs> you said it would be a pleasure to work with him again. And now I'm reading you know, now that people are reaching out to you for comment about your letter, you're saying, oh, you know, no, there's no connection, da 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 But you said in your letter it would be a pleasure to work with him again. What did you mean by that exactly? And this was somebody who was working with children. We're seeing what these child networks, who they go around, oh, we care about children. Oh, we really, we love our child actors here at Nickelodeon. And false, no. Not at all. They're the ones right there. People at Nickelodeon wrote letters in defense of a PDF file. And it was a child from their network. And they hired the PDF file. I mean, wowza. Is the world seeing this? <laughs> like... Are we all saying, hi, Josh. Alexa, you have every reason to hate Dan Schneider and Sickelodeon after all the trauma they put you through. That had to be a nightmare for you, too. Thank you so much, Josh. It was a nightmare. Oh, yeah, yeah, like this. Can you guys hear me better? It was a nightmare. And it, you know what? It wasn't only just my nightmare we're learning. <laughs> you know, this was a nightmare for Drake Bell. This was a nightmare for so many people. And it's time that Nickelodeon gets held accountable. And especially all of these people that wrote this, these disturbing letters, which, by the way, I just want to say to all the people that wrote these disturbing letters defending Brian Peck, 
You know, a lot of people probably didn't write letters when Brian Peck asked. I've heard there's some that didn't. They were like, no way. They heard and they were like, no, I'm not gonna write a letter. That's right. I know. You know, it's not my place to say who, but I know that people did not write letters. And so when you think about the people that did write letters and Rich, dude, you and your wife, you were working with children and you had the nerve to write a letter in defense of a PDF file who harmed one of the stars, someone you worked with. I mean, it's sickening. Mads, a nightmare for many, justice will come. Thank you so much, Mads. Justice is coming. I mean, it is, oh, it's here. Sorry, I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually feeling like the last couple, of, like my body's, I've, I'm feeling the stress in my shoulders from like everything just being so overwhelming. But right today, I'm feeling like a little bit of a high, you know? I'm just like, wow, it's here. People are listening. Like ABC News this morning was talking about the Me Too movement for kids. Like what? We did it. That's badass <laughs> of the Nick kids protecting the future. Protecting the future. What happened to us happened. No one can erase time for us, right? But I, I hope that our stories have an impact on this industry and the world. I really hope it does because this is pretty serious. This is pretty serious. And we have to also remember what was going on with the media during that time. I mean, there was barely any articles about Brian Peck. And apparently what we've been learning from all these people that knew Brian Peck is that he was so well connected or is so well connected within Hollywood, like so well connected. And it makes me think so I wonder who he's connected to when it came to media. Oh, it's okay. Whoop. Whoop. Wait, we got to get out of here. <laughs> My desktop, sorry. Um, so what was I saying? What was I saying? Um, it's, um, it's just th the day has come. It is here. The world is listening. It's happening. Um, and I'm just really, really feeling good. Like I'm really feeling good. I'm really feeling good. And it's remarkable how many people, 41, sorry, I'm back at it. I remember what I was talking about. 41 letters, 41 letters. from Hollywood. And this is why I was very upset with Will or Ryder, whoever was speaking when they, when they said this. They were more concerned about protecting Hollywood because of the conspiracy theories of Pizzagate. Dude, this ain't a conspiracy. You wrote the letter. <laughs> was it handwritten? Was it handwritten? You wrote the letter. This isn't a conspiracy. This is real. Yeah, sure, the outlandish conspiracy is ridiculous. That's ridiculous. There's a reality to this that is very important to talk about because how are we gonna create change if we don't discuss this? And then they went on in the podcast to say they wanted to protect Boy Meets World. They were afraid of it affecting the show. Well, you know what? <clears throat> For me personally now, when I think about Boy Meets World, sadly, I think about your letter. I will think about that. That might be the first fact that comes to my mind personally. As a survivor, that is definitely what comes to my mind now. And that's just a reality. But it was really sad. I wish that they had that same type of defense and that same type of drive when it comes to protecting, you know, Hollywood and, and Boy Meets World and Pizzagate. I wish they had that same type of energy for Drake Bell.
right? 41 letters. And someone who worked on Nickelodeon and then moved to Disney. And what's also really upsetting is Disney. So you got Nickelodeon, you know, they're going to say they they didn't, you know, know, right? Because he wasn't a registered, you know, SO when he was at Nickelodeon. But when Disney hired him, he was. And these are networks that are supposed to be protecting children and caring about children. Wild to me. Wild to me. So we're going to, we're going to, I can't, I'm, we will, when these letters come out in full form, we will be reading these letters. I want the world to read these letters and how it was framed, how they were framing it, how they were victim blaming a child. (laughs) Perfect. Victim blaming a child. And then now the victim's older and he's having to hear and read you know, what, what all of these people were saying, you have to understand, we, all, we were all trying to figure out like, wow, 16 months, right? 16 months of, of jail time for, for Brian Peck. And you have to understand these letters have an impact on someone's sentencing. So they, they were trying to, they helped him. They, they actually got in the way of a survivor's justice. They thought it was their place. Steven, welcome to the munchies. They thought it was their place to do that. And that's a reality. So, oh my God. And the Dan Schneider stuff that came out. You guys, the the Dan Schneider stuff. I, 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 we, I, we're going to get into it. It, it, It's so overwhelming. You have no idea what's been coming out about Dan Schneider. It just gets worse. It really gets worse. Everything um, that could go bad, it went bad there, basically. Just wild. And so, and I do also want to say, you know, just to address it off the top, you know, that I was, um, you know, subpoenaed by Nick Carter and um, also for for a deposition. And, you know, I can't go into detail uh, about that because I'm obviously getting you know, deposed, um, subpoenaed. (laughs) And so I can't go into detail about that, but it really goes to show you also, you know, who, who's watching, you know, eat predators. It's, 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 it's honestly kind of, um, it's honestly kind of wild and it's been overwhelming for me the last couple months. And now this is very overwhelming and it feels like it never ends really. But um, yeah, so you know that's that's where I'm at, and obviously I can keep you guys updated after I am, you know, under oath and you know the whole thing. Um, and so yeah, that's uh, that's what's going on there. So let's get into let's get into this Hollywood Reporter article that really goes into detail about the allegations against Nickelodeon. And Dan Schneider, you are not. Sorry, just, just oh, so, yeah. Uh, just so you know, I'm going to switch to your, your screen. Okay, perfect. You're, you're going to be in the wrong place for a second. I just need to see it and I can move it back to the right place. Okay, okay. No problem. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We'll go through the letters first. You guys want to hear who wrote the letters first? Um, when it comes to Brian Peck, who were, who were the, um, the good guys? As Josh Peck likes to say, who are the good guys? You know, always when you hear good guy, you're like, that's definitely not a good sign. Okay, whoa, this this chat is going. The chat is going. Okay, so we're going to get into these letters. So first of all, does anyone recognize James Marsden? Wasn't he in the notebook? Am I wrong? I think he was in the notebook. The bros. The bros. So James Marsden is one of the individuals who defended PDF file Brian Peck. This is a pretty big, I mean, I recognize this face. This person is like pretty well known in Hollywood. Pretty well known in Hollywood, right? 
So after working with Peck on movies such as Public Enemies and X-Men, Marsden 50 reflected on their friendship in his letter. I wonder if his was handwritten. Apparently, some of them are handwritten. Hand wrote them. Can you imagine handwriting one of those? And it's so, I really don't like that they're all saying like, well, we didn't know all the details. You don't need to know all the details. Why are you wanting to know all the details? Enough, it's enough what Brian Peck, what happened. Face value. It's a no to writing a letter. A child. A child. Okay, so he goes, I can easily say that Brian is one of the reasons why I've been as successful as I have been in this industry. <laughs> oh my God. Marsden wrote at the time, I love it at the time, like I am sure he doesn't, is he writing it now? Um, I was lucky enough to have been graced with Brian's guidance. Uncommissioned guidance, I might add, and support in pursuing an acting career. See how all these people, all of Hollywood, they only care about Hollywood. You hear it, right? Hollywood, Hollywood, my career, my career. We don't care if a kid's been A, B, U, S, E, D. My career, my career. Brian's given me my career. Pick me, pick me vibe. Awful. Marzen referred to Peck as a mentor to him, adding, I don't mean to dramatize this, but I am speaking wholeheartedly about a man whose heart is pure and no matter what you're talking about. Look how out of his way. Who are you talking about? His intentions are always good. Really, his intentions were good when he was, um, you know what? A-B-U-S-I-N-G, a child? I'm sure, yeah, his intentions were good. Always. Even if he was doing that, his intent, what are you even saying? Do you hear yourself? Do you freaking hear yourself? And where's your apology? I want to see all 41 letters that were sent in defense of Brian Peck sent to the victim. Apologies. Handwritten. Apologies. To the victim. If they took the time to write these letters in defense of Brian Peck, I want to see them all sent to the victim right away. As quickly as they turned around these for um, Brian Peck. Good intentions. You imagine what the victim's feeling while reading this? Oh, even if this happened, you know, whatever he was doing. How does he say it? And no, and no matter what you're talking about, what you're talking about, do you know what you're talking about? His intentions are always good. Blah. Wow. See how people think of survivors? They actually think that these uh, predators have good intentions while they are A-B-U-S-I-N-G children. All right, let's continue. Sorry, that was triggering, right? So trigger warning through this because this is this is this is tri this is all very triggering and obviously re-traumatizing for a lot of survivors. So it goes, he has such an amazing capacity to care about people. My god. This I find is very rare. How rare? Especially in Hollywood. Wow. Brian genuinely cares about other human beings. Woo! Brian Peck! Brian Peck doesn't care about human beings, in my opinion. Brian Peck didn't care about a child. According to docu-series, Marsden compared Peck's suffering after his arrest to that of a hundred men. Like trying to be like, oh, 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 hundreds of men. Marsden compared Peck's suffering after his arrest to that of a hundred men. Wow. This is phenomenal. Unbelievable. When I first heard the news of Brian's arrest, I couldn't breathe. 
Hold your breath then longer. Longer. I could not believe what was happening. It was unimaginable. Can you imagine how unimaginable it was for this victim to actually experience what he experienced at the hands of Brian Peck? This is Hollywood. Wake up and smell the bullshit. This is it. Handwritten in letter form. We're getting to see it. I've known Brian for 14 years and never once did I ever see any sign of him being capable of something like this. Didn't Brian Peck like admit to it? I read in an article, um, I read in an article that uh, Drake Bell had to be on the phone with the police in the room getting, you know, Brian Peck admits on the phone in front of the police what he did. What he did. Hmm. And I love that some of them were saying, oh, you know, I didn't know this. I didn't know that. Well, you know what? Before you write a letter like this, you should have really knew what the, you know, F you were doing, honestly. This is pretty serious. This is really serious. And I've heard that there was a person, you know, where they got asked to write one of these letters and, you know, he obviously said, no way. And I guess this lawyer was telling people that, you know, oh, he did this, he did admit to this, but oh, you know, and, and it, what? Admitted. Admitted. Someone says the stream keeps restarting for them. Everything good? Oh, it's good for on my end, I can see. Okay, so let's move on here. I have lived, oh, here we go. So I have lived at his house for months and shared hotel rooms with him. And never once did he ever make me feel compromised or uncomfortable in any way. Are you, a, were you a child? Like also how old was Marsden during this? And second of all, I, I really don't like when people try to go up against what a survivor has experienced because they didn't experience it from that person. It, it's not, you know what I mean? That is something that's really upsetting. Just because it didn't happen to you doesn't mean it didn't happen to the person saying it happened to them. <laughs> really ridiculous. Um, I've known Brian for 14 years and never once I see any sign, blah, blah, blah. I have lived at his house for months and shared hotel rooms with him. That's also kind of like, what? Isn't that weird? When you wrote that, wasn't it kind of like... Is this kind of a weird boundary cross in a professional environment that you're like sharing hotel rooms with him and living at his house? And never once did he ever make me feel compromised. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, I, nothing happened, but I shared a bed with him. You're like, why, why are you so close to Brian Peck? What, what, what exactly is going on here? All right. I don't know what it would take to have something like this occur. Wait, what did he say? I don't know what it would, oh, you're victim blaming there. What it would take. Oh, so, so something had to have happened that, that's what made Brian Peck what? A-B-U-S-E, a child. Do you hear the words that are coming out of your mouth, man? This is wild. Um, whatever it is, it's extremely out of character for Brian. Get out of here. Marzin was also mentioned in X-Men producer Thomas DeSanto's letter about Peck. DeSanto 56 noted that Peck served as Marzin's best man when he married Lisa Lind in 2000. Us Weekly has reached out to uh, Marzin for comment. Yeah, where's your comment, Marzin? I want to hear your comment. And while you're at it, I, I hope you're writing a letter and, 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 and sending it to the victim now that the world especially knows who it is. You know, we know we have a now face to this person. This person's a human being and deserves an apology. Doesn't have to forgive you or accept it. But nonetheless, you have to apologize personally, directly. Time for some accountability. All right. Look at this one. Do you guys know this guy? Everyone knows this guy. SNL. Taryn, is it kill him? Yep, yep, yep. So apparently Taryn 
wrote a letter in defense of Brian Peck as well. Let's see what he said here. Ooh, I first met Brian Peck four years ago while working together on a television show. We instantly became friends, which seems to be a common response to meeting Brian. The Comedian 41 wrote in his letter, over the years, Brian has become one of my dearest friends. I know him quite well on both a professional and personal level. Did you share a hotel with him too? Brian has to be one of the most well-liked people I have ever known. I think this, is, this has to do a great deal with his generosity, genuine concern for others' well-being, and especially his honesty. Listen, people really need to start understanding what predators do. They, they prey on everyone around them. Everyone around them to gain access to their victim. And they try to use people as a way to protect them from any type of accountability, but not only to protect them, to give them access to what they want. And remember, predatory behavior is not um, an actual thing. It's about power and control. And it shows up in many different ways for many different people. SEX is only, you know, that's one way of it, but there's many other ways. And it seems like Brian Peck is a collector of people, uses that to gain access to his victim, right? But it still doesn't give an excuse for these letters. Still not an excuse when it comes to these horrific letters. So here we go. Brian has to be one of the most well-liked people I've ever known. His well-being and his honesty. Killam referred to Peck's arrest as too out of character. When I found out about Brian being arrested, I was shocked. Brian is the last person I would expect to be charged with criminal activities. My first thought was, this is a mistake. I know many of our mutual friends had similar thoughts, he added. I have seen the effects the situation has had on Brian, and I know for a fact that he regrets any mistakes made and that this is certainly not something that would ever happen again. This is a child. This is a child. Also, it reminds me of the podcast episode. Remember when, I don't know if it was Ryder or Will, but he was like, I don't want to damage, you know, this person's life more than we already have. And he was not talking about Drake Bell, by the way. He was talking about Brian Peck. You're like, you don't want to. Who cares right now about Brian Peck? Brian Peck ruined it for himself. You know? Who wants to hear that? He only regrets getting caught. <sighs> Exactly, Christina. What did Christina say? This is so sick. Yeah, it is. It's horrible. All right. So then Killam concluded, there is yet to be a set that I work on where someone doesn't know Brian and also doesn't think the world of him. He honestly is one of the most well-liked, well-respected people in this business. Thank you, Taryn. How sweet. <laughs> How sweet. What a... What a friend you have in Brian Peck. What the fuck is this shit? <laughs> what the fuck is this? Is this not blowing? Who is Tom DeSanto? So I guess when I was looking up Tom DeSanto, he has something to do with Brian Singer. I think it's X-Men. Yeah, here we go. So this is Tom DeSanto. Following their time working together on X-Men, DeSanto had nothing but praise for Peck. The Brian Peck that I know is a man who is always there when a friend is in need, DeSanto wrote. The Brian Peck I know is well-respected and loved professional who has worked in the entertainment industry for over 20 years. That is why his arrest was so surprising and totally out of character. He has worked with actors as a coach for many years with never one whisper of improper conduct. His actors speak of him in the highest regard and continue their friendship even after the working relationship has ended. Before the docuseries premiered, DeSanto issued a statement to Us Weekly, which read, oh, here we go. Here's a statement. 
Having dedicated a significant portion of my career to shedding light on systemic ABUSE and advocating for those without a voice, these experiences have profoundly shaped my understanding of responsibility and advocacy and is at the core of who I am. Did you apologize to him? This is going to be my question as we go along this list, okay? Did you apologize? Did you write a letter? <laughs> I can't stress this enough. Have you written a letter, handwritten, apologizing to the victim? If that is, if responsibility and advocacy is at the core of who you are, I really hope that you handwrite a letter to the victim. Apologizing, that's it, no excuses, an apology. He continued, my decisions at the time were based on incomplete information given to me. Oh, here's the excuse. And I lacked full awareness of the gravity of the accusations. With the knowledge and understanding I possess today, I want to personally apologize to Drake. Okay, here we go. Okay. And his fa family and emphatically state that I had been fully informed of all accusations, my support would have been absolutely withheld. This situation underscores the critical importance of due diligence and the relentless pursuit of truth, especially when it comes to standing in solidarity with survivors of ABUSE. I really still hope, though, he wrote that letter. I want to see him handwritten. I'm, I'm that person, right? I know. I, maybe you guys will disagree with me, but I am that person. I want to see these letters handwritten. I don't want to see it on Us Weekly, and I don't want to see it come through a PR person. I want to see these handwritten happening just because of the, the, the gravity of this, you know, the gravity of this. But I appreciate that he did say an apology. I still i am going to center the victim in this, and this still probably does not feel good. Oh, here they are. Ready? You guys ready to see? Here is Pod Meets Pizzagate. <laughs> Here they are. Isn't it now all making sense why that podcast episode came out? Okay. The, the Boy Meets World co-stars addressed their past friendship with Peck shortly before the docuseries was released. See? How to get ahead of the narrative. Now it all makes sense. Strong 44 and is it Friedel? 47, met Peck, Peck during his time as a guest star on their hit sitcom, which ran from 1993 to 2000. Their letters were also featured on Quiet on Set, with one stating, it was extremely disturbing to learn of Brian's arrest. Maliciousness is so, what is it, An antithetical In, to his nature? It is impossible for me to comprehend a situation that would lead him to do something illegal or even inappropriate. I immediately called him and offered whatever support I could. Of course, Brian being Brian, he had already received numerous such calls. Yeah, 41 letters here. Strong clarified on his Pod Meets World podcast last month that he wasn't aware of the charges brought against Peck. But wasn't he at the sentencing? If I'm wrong about this, when we were listening to the podcast, I could have sworn that he was there, which means, don't they say what he was? I think this was all easy to figure out. And also, from my knowledge, you know, from what I've heard, you know, Brian Peck, lawyers, things going on, people knew, you know, that he was admitting to this. So this is all a little bit odd to me. He didn't say that nothing had happened. Okay, so here, I, I was just going to say it. Okay, so he says, he didn't say that nothing had happened. So by the time we heard about this case and knew anything about it, it was always in the context of, I did this thing. I am guilty. I'm going to take whatever pun. Oh, so wait, this is so weird. What does he say up here? Look, wait, I thought it was them saying that they had no idea. What do you mean? Oh, right here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Wait, this is so confusing. He didn't say that nothing had happened. So by the time we heard about this case and knew no anything about it, it was always in the context of, I did this thing, I'm guilty, I'm going to take whatever punishment the government determines, but I'm a victim of jail bait. Do you know what that term is? Jail bait's the worst term. That's what PDF files use. That's a sure sign of a PDF file. If anyone is saying this person is jail bait, The word itself. What? Oh. There was this hot guy. Hot guy. A child. I just did this thing. This thing. And he's underage. Underage, he's a child. And we bought that storyline. So wait, you bought the storyline... They, you did this thing. Did you ever go like, what is the thing? And how old and we can show my screen. Oh my God. I never heard about the other things because back then you couldn't Google to find out what people were being charged with. So in retrospect, he was making a plea deal and admitting one thing, which is all he admitted to us. But it looks like he was being charged with a series of crimes, which we did not know. Okay. <laughs> Friedel, meanwhile, expressed regret at attending Peck sentencing. But you were at the sentencing. At any point, you could have stood up, right? And, and you saw the child there? Who's like probably was like, you know, maybe 17 or 18 at this time. I'm trying to think of the year. Nonetheless, you know when the, when the charges were coming forward, what year it was. You're seeing the, 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 the mom, the stepdad, the brother... At any time, you could have gone, wait a minute, what is, ha like, what? Wow. But again, protecting Hollywood. We're sitting in that courtroom on the wrong side of everything, the victim's mother turned and said, look at all these famous people you brought with you, and it doesn't change what you did to my kid. He recalled, I just sat there wanting to D-I-E. It was like, what the hell am I doing here? It was horrifying all the, w all the way around. Okay, but, okay. Friedel added, we are, to see how this whole thing's being framed though? I really, this is kind of scaring me. This is very serious. These people wrote letters protecting a PDF file. And all I'm hearing yet again, all the time, is how protected everyone else is. Everyone else is, but the survivor. You see it? All the excuses, this, that. I really rarely see it for the survivor. And everyone's like, oh, don't, don't, don't be so hard on them. And, you know, the reason why I find enablers not only re-traumatizing and triggering, but prob a big problem is because it, they help perpetuate the ABUSE. And... Predators look for safe havens. And just remember, Hollywood is full of people writing letters in protection of PDF files. Imagine how many didn't sign a letter because they were being smart not to, but probably told Brian on the phone, you know, like, I can't really do that. My lawyers aren't letting me. They probably would look bad, yada, yada, yada. But I support you. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of Hollywood did just that. And then you have these guys who literally went on the record, basically, you know, defending him. Oh, look who else it is. Do you know who this guy is? This is Alan Thicke. You know whose dad this is? This is Robin Thicke's dad. Doesn't Robin Thicke have his own allegations, if I remember correctly? Well, why do I know that name? Jude Robin Thicke, that song of um, Blurred Lines, which was literally a song that people say, you know, uh, references like the R word. It's literally called Blurred Lines. And he's like a very, very, uh, very well-known um, singer. Who I in piss. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Phoebe Bridgers. Wait, what is everyone saying? Remember when the seventh heaven... Yes, I do remember that. We should do an episode about that. I totally forgot about the seventh heaven. That was wild how he got busted, too. 
That's like wild how he got busted. Okay, wait. All right, let, let's let, let's let's continue here. Let's see let's see what Alan um Thick here has to uh, has to say. Shall we? I worked with Brian Peck daily from 1987 through 1991 and found him to be highly professional and a nurturing mentor of the young people on your television set, on our television set, because he was never inappropriate in any way around children, including my own two young sons. Wow. I was shocked and saddened to learn of the trouble he was in. The trouble he was in? The, the late actor wrote at the time of the case, knowing him as I did, I also know beyond a doubt how remorseful he is and how dedicated and focused he will be on his rehabilitation. So, you know, so look how weird this letter is. Let's, let's dissect this letter, right? Let's, let's dissect it a little bit. See how he says, oh, he's never done anything to my, my two young sons. But then he goes into saying, like, whatever he did, you know, he's remorseful about it. So you're admitting that he told you, right? What he did. So you knew what he did. But you just didn't do it to your sons, so you didn't care. You didn't care because it wasn't your sons. I'm gonna say it as it is. You mentioned your two young sons here. How, do, how could you write that? The first thing I think about when I hear these stories, I think like, you, you wanna protect you, you want to make sure nothing happens to children, right? That's just the worst thing of all when you think of that. Someone harming children, you know, you're like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, he, he, he's unalive, 2016. Wow. Well, what a legacy right here. Um, so the knowing him as I did, I also know beyond a doubt how remorseful he is and how dedicated and focused, blah, blah, blah. Brian's integrity and self-respect have always been important to him. And this turn of events has been mortifying to him. Imagine how mortifying it is for the victim. How is no one? Ah! Don't you just want, don't you just want to yell at the rooftops? I do. Mortifying for hi who? Him? Who cares? Didn't he ABU as a child? Like, why am I thinking about him? You should have thought about that before. Correct. Hmm? Boo who? Boo who? To, for, to Brian Peck. That will only make him a better, stronger citizen in the future. Oh, we got a woman in here. Okay, so who's this? Joanna Kearns? Does anyone know who Joanna Kearns is? Oof, okay. What'd she have to say? In addition to Thick, whom he met on the set of Growing Pains, Peck received support from former co-star Kearns, 71, as well as a docuseries quoted a section of Kearns' letter, which read, I could only believe there must have been some extreme situation or temptation exerted upon him to influence his actions. I did not, I actually got nauseous reading that. Nope, 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 nope. Who writes this at any time? By the way, this wasn't like in the 1800s these freaking people wrote this. It was like the early 2000s. It wasn't that long ago. I mean, you're writing that you are, you're literally, it's like you're telling, you're saying that the child is at fault. Literally. That's what you basically said and wrote down. Temptation. A child. A grown man. Kearns issued a statement in response to her show of support for Peck, which was included in Quiet on Set. I have now learned that my letter of support was based on complete misinformation. She stated, knowing what I know now, I never would have written the letter. Yeah, or whatever. Well, you did. <laughs> so here's another one. Okay, Kimmy Robertson. Who is Kimmy Robertson? Robertson, 69, who appeared in Peck's 1990 movie, The Willies, wrote in a letter to the judge, I believe with all my heart that Brian was pressured. 
and pushed beyond belief before he caved in. Oh my God. You know, they know it's a child. The way they're, you know, like the way that they're talking, it's very clear as day for me personally that they are aware that this is a child. You see how they're writing it? So they knew. But he caved. Oh, yeah, that kid. What? Inexcusable. I really mean it. There's really no excuse for, for this. You just say, I'm sorry. That was horrible of me. Horrible. Horrible to blame a child. I don't care who you know. I don't care who you know and how well you think you know them. Child. All right, here it is. You ready for Rich? Here's Richie. So Rich and Beth, Carol, look at the t-shirt. I love that they chose this photo. Icons of darkness. Really, you two are. Icons of darkness. The couple stood by Peck at the time, which Rich, 75, he was at Disney. I'm pretty positive he directed my episode of Sweet Life of Zach and, Zach and Cody. Writing in his letter, it would be my pleasure to work with him again. Rich and Beth, 58, professionally crossed paths with Peck two years after he was sentenced for um, Child S.A. when they worked together on The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. The Corals released a statement for the docuseries which noted that they had no input or involvement in the casting. Oh, you just happened to be there, huh? You just happened to write a letter to a judge saying it would be a pleasure to work with him again, then poof, he just magically appeared on your set. <laughs> I don't believe you. I'm entitled to my opinion. I don't know if I believe you. I don't know. I don't know if I can believe you. That seems a little bit too weird of a coincidence. Coinky dink. Um, for what you wrote and then what happened. And what I find very interesting about Brian Peck's role on The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, and I can't stress this enough, is that he was the voice for the weird, creepy mirror, honestly. We all know. Which means they knew, in my opinion, had to have known he was a registered SO because you can't be in direct contact with kids. So it was a way to get around it. Voiceover. Ew. You better hope no one snitches on you, Rich. Ugh. Right? Ugh. Ugh. I don't I don't know if I believe you. I don't know if I believe you, especially since you wrote this letter, right? All right, let's see what else Rich says here. Um, they said when they asked him about the case, Mr. Peck simply replied that the problem had been resolved. That's all he said? He didn't apologize to Drake? <gasps> You're worse than I thought. He didn't apologize, did he? I don't see it. Did anyone else see it? Do do do. No, Mr. Peck simply replied that the problem has been. You, ooh, that that was a burn. That was a burn. You wrote a letter protecting a PDF file, a kid that worked on your freaking sets. You wrote it would be a pleasure to work with him again. You went against the victim a child, and you still, you don't apologize? God, I wish I could go back to Sweet Life of Zach and Cody when you were there and go up to you and say, you're fired. Even though I don't have the power, I would have loved to just say it to your face. Gross, dude. We don't want you on set. I don't, I wouldn't. <laughs> that is so upsetting. Hand write a letter. Now no one even wants your letter. But I do, I'm going to say this to each person who has wrote these freaking letters in defense of Brian Peck. Hand write letters and send them to the victim. I want to see it. I want to see it. Okay, so there was 41 though. So these were only a few. 
um, of the letters. Look how, look at this. I mean, this is so, there's Ryder. <laughs> um, we got Taryn. And wow, the James Marsden is pretty wild to me that he, he was uh, writing a letter to protect a, uh, stress it again, a PDF file. Um, but there's 41, and I, I, I want to see all 41 letters. I want to know who were the people because I want to stay away from them, personally. And Rich, I mean, this was somebody, so many kids worked with Rich on kid shows. So many. I think there's like literally a video um, of him that I definitely actually want to pull up. Just hold on a second. I want to pull up this. Um, let me see if I can find it. There were like these series of videos, essentially. I wish I could find them. There were like these series of, of uh, an interview where basically he talks about like how to work with kids. Oh, here it is. I think it is. You guys want to watch it? Let's hear, let's watch this first part. Let's watch it. You all ready? This is how rich, and tell me what it reminds you of right away. Well, the, the studio, you can show my screen. The studio is shaking, it's so windy. The lizard is, is happy in here. Okay, okay, let's watch this. Working with kids is um, kind of its own entity because the, the best you can get out of kids will be if they think you're one of them. It doesn't mean you I have don't think to I be can. childish. Maybe here? Let's see. Run around, run around and act. But you have to go in there, talk to them about their family life, what they're doing, what wait, they Wait, wait, wait. Let's listen to this. Let's like, listen to this. Listen to this. Entity because the the best you can get out of kids will be if they think you're one of them. It doesn't mean you have to be childish and run around and act. But you have to go in there Talk to them about their family life, what they're doing, what they watch, what they like. They Kids always respond when they think that you're paying attention to them. Right. And the parents really respond. I just want to say really quickly, pause it here. Does that not sound like brooming, what he's describing here? I mean, this is literally Brooming 101 by uh, Rich Carell. Is it not? What, is this guy for real? Yeah, he's for real. This is who we were working with. This is who we were working for. This is who was supposed to like look out for us and listen to what he's saying. We'll, we'll keep playing it. If you're paying attention to them. Because when you say cut and the kid walks off the set, he usually walks back to the parents or the teachers and the, the parents and teachers go, gee, that was great. You're having this dialogue with the director and he talked to you and he cares about you and this is great. So it's a different kind of dynamic because you want kids to think that you're one of them, but you also have to be the responsible adult. Now, kids right. shows- Right, Rich, you... which by the way, um, Brian Peck was not. Right? And neither were you. And you're still not a responsible adult. You made a statement defending your ass, basically, when it came to Brian Peck getting hired by Disney on your set, your show, whatever. But you didn't apologize. You're not a responsible adult. And this video that you created literally sounds like Brooming 101, and it's creeping me out that these were the people that we were working for. It really upsets me. Ah, so that's, I, I'm done with Rich Carell, but I wanted to show you a little, uh, this is how Rich Carell talks. That's how he talks. That's, that's who he is. Yeah, Rich Guy's full name is um, Rich, and then it's Coral, Carell, C-O-R-R-E-L-L. -L. So at least I personally have a feeling, I, I just don't believe him when it comes to Brian Peck. I don't believe you. What are you gonna do about it? <laughs> I just I don't I don't believe you. I don't think that you had nothing to do with uh, the Brian Peck. Too too weird of a quink eating for me personally, but whatever. We're, strange things happen, I guess. Moving on to Hollywood Reporter. Actually, before that, do you guys want to watch the 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 most wild thing that came out the other day? The John Wayne Gacy connection with Brian Peck. 
this was a good guy. I love everyone. Oh, genuine. Oh God, I love him. Like he's unbelievable. The best guy in the world. Pen pals with John Wayne Gacy. And was telling children that. Oh, wait, let me see. Hi Alexa, how are you? You are so amazing. Hi Peyton, how are you? So nice to see you. I mean like, John Wayne Gacy, I love them all. Oh, he's so nice, yada, 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 yada. Pulls out letters that he, he's writing to, to and from John Wayne Gacy while he's in prison. And has like a painting from John Wayne Gacy. So let, let's watch, I really wanna watch this um, quick little trailer that just came out. Um, it, it was mind blowing. Shall we watch this together? Let's do it. I remember at the time, I think it was about like two and a half years in, everyone went to Brian's house for a barbecue and his house was a little off. He had a room that was- Make a theater? A theater man? dedicated to like vintage toys and comic books. And he converted his garage into like a Planet of the Apes shrine. I noticed a painting in the room that stuck out to me because it had nothing to do with Planet of the Apes. It was of a birthday clown holding balloons. And oh my God, because remember John Wayne Gacy was a clown, remember? And if my mom's in the chat, maybe you can tell your story when you went to John. There's a, my mom has a John Wayne Gacy story, strangely enough. And Brian got very excited when I asked him about it. He flipped the thing around and on the back it said, to Brian, I hope you enjoy the painting. <gasps> Best wishes, your friend, John Wayne Gacy. Oh! It was a self-portrait of serial killer, John Wayne Gacy. At this point, I'm like 14. Oh I didn't know God. like the details, but I knew like this guy's a serial killer who like killed a lot of young men and boys. Oh my, my God, that's not a red. I know it's not. These are children put in this situation. What I the love fuck you. Is now, this shit? Yeah, what the fuck is this shit? And then you have to remember, like, these these people wrote letters. Oh, he's so amazing. Have you been to his house? I thought you I thought you lived with him, Marsden, or whatever your name is. Didn't you say you lived with him? You know about that? John Wayne Gacy? I mean, what? Oh, he was such a nice guy. We love him. So, us Ooh. being the good guys we are. <laughs> Uh, that's literally those letters. <laughs> okay, let's let's keep watching. It was like everyone has to see this, and so like all the parents and the kids come into the room, and then Brian presents the painting again. <gasps> and Brian actually developed a pen pal relationship with John. He kept like this pile of letters and photos from John Wayne Gacy in his nightstand next to his bed, and he like pulls them out and starts showing them to me, your instinct is- What? I'm sorry, is everybody else feeling the feeling that I'm feeling? Wait, is everyone, is everyone with me? This is, this is a whole other level. This is what I mean the last couple of days. It's like, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And there's more, by the way, there's more. This is just mind blowing. All right, let's continue. Give someone the benefit of the doubt. If you've known them for that long, even in the face of like this really bad sign, it was one of those like classic failures of group psychology. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they were kids. And if you heard in the beginning, the parents like went in there, you know, but it's so, sur it's such a surreal thing. It's so surreal imagining that scenario. Like what a surreal thing. And that's what's so weird. It's like, oh, so Marsden, you lived at his house? You aware of that room? You aware of the pen pal with John Wayne Gacy? Like this is why it's all to me garbage. You know, no one's that great also, right? How they're talking about him. Geez, you would think he walked on water. You know, no one's that, you know, whatever, you know? 
a little bit odd. Like how, like, what does he have on you? It always makes me think about that whole Epstein thing, you know, where predators also will put people into situations that are very shameful intentionally on purpose so that the person doesn't ever do anything against them because they have like blackmail on them, right? And so I always think about that, like why so many letters, you know? I'm not, you know, just wondering, it's a question. Just a little bit odd, right? Who gets 41 letters? Hard to sometimes even get a text back from somebody, right? 41 letters, especially when he was being, you know, what he did. All right, so moving on to this Hollywood reporter. Now we're gonna get into Dan Schneider. We're gonna get into the quiet on set. We're gonna see, we're gonna talk about a little, a, a couple of the things that have been leaked um, when it comes to the upcoming episodes and let's just digest, let's talk about it. There is a lot here. It is wild what has come out with Dan Schneider. And so um, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're in this together right now. So let's uh, buckle up and start to learn what people have to say about Dan Schneider and Nickelodeon. Oh, okay, here it goes. Drake and Josh star, Drake Bell, is the biggest former child actor to allege having faced toxic workplaces at Nickelodeon while performing on Dan Schneider's hit TV shows, sets as part of Investigation Discovery's docuseries, Quiet on Set, The Dark Side of Kids TV. For the first time, Bell shares his story of alleged ABUSE at the hands of Brian Peck, his former dialogue coach who was convicted of essaying a Nickelodeon child actor in 2004. Bell is not alone. The ID four-parter probes the toxic environment claims on sets run by Schneider, who created Nickelodeon hit programs like The Amanda Show, Drake and Josh, Zoe 101, iCarly, Victorious, and Sam and Cat, and helped launch the careers of Kenan Thompson, Amanda Bynes, Victoria Justice, Miranda Cosgrove, Jeanette McCurdy, and others. Here are some of the revelations about allegations of ABUSE, um, blank, racism, and inappropriate behavior involving underage stars and crew and alleged predators at the network as set to be revealed in Quiet on the Set, which premieres across two nights on ID, March 17th and 18th. Here we go. Oh my God, are we ready? Sorry, this was, this is, I'm like freaking out. Yeah. How's that? Wait, also this needs to go. Okay. Here we go. Dan Schneider allegedly ran or tolerated a toxic workplace conditions on his hit TV show sets at Nickelodeon. Former creatives, crew members who worked with Schneider on or behind the camera claim they endured toxic workplaces. Working for Dan was like being in an ABUSIVE relationship, Chrissy Stratton, one of only two women writers on The Amanda Show, along with Jenny Kilgan, tells the docuseries. What's more, Stratton and K Kilgan had to split a normal staff writer's salary to get hired. And it wasn't long before Stratton recalls being told by Schneider he thinks women, he didn't think women were funny. Words from Dan Schneider. And why are they like the, the, the leads of your shows? <laughs> Weird. Um, Kilgan adds, he challenged us to name a funny female writer. And he said this to the writers in the writer's room. Kilgan says Schneider allegedly had, do you guys see this? P-O-R-N-O, -O, up on his computer screen and told her he'd put one of her sketches in the show in return for a massage. what I say? What have I been saying? The massages. I'm saying this for a long time. Look at that. Ugh. Look at that. This is really messed up. This is really, he had P-O-R-N-O -O on his computer screen. Thank you, corn. Corn, that sounds so ridiculous. Corn on his computer screen. Yikes. Okay, let's keep going. He always presented it like a joke. 
and he'd be laughing while he said it. But you always felt like disagreeing with Dan or standing up for yourself could get you fired. Asking Stratton to lean across her desk and simulate being... I can't say this word. You guys see it? This is really bad. He had a woman lean across her desk and simulate this. Dan Schneider. He, this is his employee. This is, he, this is someone who works for him. Told you. Told you. I would not do that today, but I did it then. A strikingly embarrassed Stratton says on camera. So sad. So sad. And for on-screen talent, Schneider was a kingmaker. The one who decided who became a star, including Amanda Bynes, and who would have their lines or even character roles cut from a series. Raquel, Raquel Lee Balu... I don't know how to say the last name. Um, who appeared on The Amanda Show during its first season when she was 12. As you wanted Dan to like you. Because otherwise, he was mean to you. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit emotional just because you, you have no idea. Like, this is something I was saying, like, I experienced, you know, firsthand, and, I, and no one believed me. So, you know, this is, this is, this is a big deal. This, this is a big deal to, ha to see kids, like, legit validating one another's experience and how we were treated. Wait, what is this? Dan with a plan to pack? Oh, no, no, no. What is that? What is that? A troll? Oh, my God. The Dan troll? Oh, my God. Go, get out of here, Dan. Get out of here, Dan. You're done, so. Um, all right. This is just, you have no idea. This was like, to hear other um, Nick stars it's so sad that we've had similar experiences, but at the same time, it's also so validating. And this is just, this is a huge deal. This is a huge deal. Power to survivors. Okay, The Amanda Show. Okay, ba ba ba. here we go. Case in point, Schneider apparently flipped out when he decided a birthday cake on set for Raquel was too big. Then the jocular Schneider was replaced by a screaming tyrant. Dan yelled a lot. Dan was like a tornado. He'd show up and you'd say, what just happened? Dan, sh Dan showed up. The set wouldn't feel the same when, when he'd leave because everyone was on their toes scared. Woo! Go Raquel! I, this is, woo! Speak, your, speak the truth. Truth to power. Truth to power. Toxic workplaces in Hollywood are not new, but Nickelodeon sets stood out for being filled with vulnerable child actors. Kid actors were made to wear suggestive costumes and take part in inappropriate sketches full of physical comedy and hinting at corn, uh, corn undertones, the series claims. An example is Leon Frierson, who is part of season four through six of All That, which also starred a young Amanda Bynes. In the doc, Leon recalls playing the character of Captain Big Nose. You guys, is everyone still here? Are you, let's, okay, let's take a breath for what's about to be said here. Captain Big Nose in a superhero costume of tights and underwear. Beside his prosthetic nose attached to his face, Fearson had matching noses on his shoulders. You can't help but notice that it looks like P, P word and T word on my shoulders, he recalled. And as part of the sketch comedy, Captain Big Nose unleashed a giant sneeze due to his allergy to asteroids. <laughs> The result was a messy goo left on the face of a young woman in his path. The joke in that sketch is effectively a C-U-M shot joke. He said it too. Leon. I mean, 
These are kids. This is disgusting. I don't think anyone's understanding. This is disgusting. I can't even believe I just read what I read. So Dan was doing these um, goo on children and women's faces for how long at Nickelodeon? And I love that Dan's trying to throw Nickelodeon under the bus. This has to be part of why they didn't do the award show, right? Well, like, they just announced it. It's going to be, by the way, so we have, we have the protest coming up on the 19th. Um, but they're, they just announced the Kids' Choice Awards because they don't give a fuck, right? They, they, they said their comment. They knew they can say their comment and just ignore us forever, even though they exploited us. We don't make a dime from the, from the child laborer. Not a dime. No residuals. We have no money. Exploited children. They say their little comment that sounded like chat GBT. Their comment sounded like chat GBT. And then they just move on with the Kids' Choice Awards. Don't worry, we'll be protesting that, that Kids' Choice Awards. It happens to actually fall on ePredator's birthday. So the first day I ever protested was July 13th, and it is on July 13th. So thank you. <laughs> it will be a perfect day to roll up and um, protest Nickelodeon. But see how they don't care still? Why well, do a Kids' Choice Award this year? Okay, so is everyone hearing what we're, we're, we're saying here? This is so disturbing. All right, so the joke in that sketch is effectively a C-U-M shot joke. It's a C-U-M shot joke for children. Great. Um, Cole, culture writer, tells the doc in the first episode, Fearson adds, looking back, it's very strange. Frankly, it was just uncomfortable. In the moment, I thought this is what we got to do to stay on the show, to stay in the cast and stay in the good graces of people that were higher up. And that specifically meant doing right by Schneider. Being close to Dan could mean an extra level of success. It was important to be on his good side. And he made it known who was on his good side, he insists. Woo! Applaud. <laughs> applaud, applaud, applaud. All right, here we go. What's next? Former Nickelodeon star Drake Bell tells his story of alleged, alleged, uh, get out of here with this garbage. We, we like, convicted, convicted. You see how they always put that? Alleged. How is it alleged? I don't really understand. Why do you have to phrase it like that? There's so many other legal ways, by the way, to phrase that better than that. <laughs> so who wrote this, Jay Pensky? Oh yeah, it is, it's the Hollywood Reporter. Okay, so um, the third episode of Quiet On Set centers on Drake Bell graphically recounting how he was allegedly broomed and suffered alleged SA at the hands of Nickelodeon dialogue coach, Brian Peck. In 2003, Peck was accused of M, a child. He was subsequently convicted of lewd act against a child, and I can't even say these words, of a person under 16 and spent 16 months in prison. Only 16 months, you guys. Only now do we learn Bell, then a minor at 15 years of age, and the star of Nickelodeon shows like All That and The Amanda Show, was at the center of that criminal case and conviction. He recounted waking one morning while on Peck's living room couch. Trigger warning, trigger warning. I woke up to him. I woke up, opened my eyes, and he was essaying me. I froze and I was in complete shock. I had no idea what to do or how to react, Bell recounts. Peck is said to have manipulated Bell's mother and others to allow himself free reign with a minor. It just got worse and worse and worse and worse. And I was just trapped and I had no way out, Bell adds. It was only when the mother of Bell's then girlfriend asked why Peck wouldn't stop calling him that Bell sought therapy, but he was still not ready to share his secret. Then I realized it was so calculated. You, Peck moved all the pieces into place. The whole thing was mental manipulation, Bell says of Peck's behavior. 
It's a theme many now adult actors claim about their childhood selves on Nickelodeon shows during the Quiet on Set series. If they spoke up themselves or had a parent do so on their behalf, they fear they feared retribution and never being able to work again. This is true. But eventually in 2003, Bell talked to the police after finally telling his mother. I have no idea what pro provoked it, what happened, but I just screamed into the phone everything that had happened to me, Bell said. He recalled a brutal interview with two detectives and having to call Peck to get him to admit his guilt on a tapped phone. Can you imagine this? It's like a, this is like a movie. It's like real life, but it feels like a movie. He had to call with the, with the police there. Re-traumatize. Like, so re-traumatizing. Talking to his predator got him to admit. Look what survivors go through. And they get letters sent against them. Okay, let's see what, 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 what's going on here. Okay, so I have no idea. Brutal interview with two detectives. He did with the full confession. Immediately after Peck's arrest, Bell recalled a phone call from Schneider asking if the case had anything to do with him. I was close enough with Dan that I was like, yeah, man, this is what he's been doing. Dan just goes, you don't need to talk anymore about it. That's all I needed to hear. Are you okay? Do you need anything from me? Anything you need? Interesting. Bell tells the doc series, then when asked whether other Nickelodeon execs reached out to him personally, Bell made excuses. I'm not really sure how many people knew who it was. It wasn't really brought up to me a lot, maybe because it was a sensitive subject, but really the only person that I remember being there for me was Dan. So that's pretty interesting. It's interesting because from my knowledge, you know, it seems like Rich and um, when I was kind of like looking at the IMDb, it seems like Rich, you know, Rich, the one who wrote the letter in defense of Brian Peck, it seemed like they, I think, worked together before on other projects um, before Brian ended up at Nickelodeon. And so I don't know who brought Brian Peck into the Nickelodeon realm. But I just find it interesting that I've heard like all these different things where like Brian Peck and, you know, Dan Schneider, um, there, there's like the, the camp thing, which I don't, you know, I, we don't know all the details when it comes to that. Um, but it's just interesting that Dan was very, was concerned for Drake. And that is what Drake deserves in that scenario. Like that's, that's how you show up for somebody. You tell them they don't have to be re-traumatized. They don't have to say what happened ever again if they don't want to. And just, what do you need from me, basically? You know, that that's actually surprising that Dan Schneider was like that. It's kind of interesting. What, 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 are, what is everyone's thoughts about that? What, I want to know in the comments and also in just this live chat, what, why do you think Dan Schneider... Interesting that he called him and wanted to know if it was him. That's interesting, too. I don't know. I have a couple questions, though. In a statement, here we go. So Nickelodeon, remember the other day we were all putting ones and twos in the chat um, when we were trying to say if Nickelodeon was going to say a statement? Uh, well, they did. Well, they did. So in a statement, Nickelodeon said, now that Drake Bell has disclosed his identity as the plaintiff in the 2004 case, we are dismayed and saddened to learn of the trauma he has endured. And we commend and support the strength required to come forward. Well, I heard they knew. We all, we all are talking. Everyone. Nickelodeon. Hello, you can't really do this shit anymore. Like we're adults also now and we like can all like we we got you figured out. <laughs> we got you figured out. You there it was known. It was known. So that was that's a little bit of a deflection, but very interesting, right? That Nickelodeon has officially made a statement and um completely neglecting, you know, what actually they approved of on their shows 
from the Ariana Grande to my experience, which is awful. Saying this, this shirt makes my make, makes me look chesty. I was a child. And what Dan says is that Nickelodeon approved of everything. A whole bunch of execs approved of that. A child saying that at 12 years old on their show. They're really deflecting and not addressing a very important issue here as well, which was the exploitation of children and eschewalizing them. Still not addressing it. Not good enough, Nickelodeon. Not good enough. Dan Schneider allegedly tormented and humiliated the cast and crew on his TV sets. Here we go. There's more. Let's just keep going. As Schneider grew more powerful as a kid's TV producer, his relationships with fellow creatives apparently worsened to the point of alleged ABUSE, the series claims. He would come down and yell and scream. There were many times I had to say, you're creating an atmosphere on the set that is not healthy. All that director Virgil Fabian um, alleges in Quiet on the Set's second episode. That toxicity extended to the um, edit suite. Karen Finley Thompson, an editor on all that, The Amanda Show and Drake and Josh, claims she and others in production had little life outside to, little life outside work when working with Schneider. You didn't eat. You didn't go to the bathroom. Dan would be, wait, 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 wait a minute. Hold it. Can you wait a minute? Oh, I kind of remember that, actually. And she'd given in to the incessant demands. We all did it. Or you got fired, Thompson adds. She recalls one day kneeling over in the edit suite, having to go to the hospital. As I'm leaving and curled over, I could hear someone saying, how is this show going to get finished? And I remember just saying, I'll be right back. I can't believe I just read that. That is wild. Wild. Okay. The docuseries argues it took the hashtag MeToo movement to stop Schneider in his tracks at Nickelodeon, not internal controls. After the hashtag MeToo movement, Schneider and Nickelodeon finally parted ways following years of whispers and rumors. Before that, the network in 2014 launched an internal investigation into workplace conditions on Sam and Kat, which starred Ariana Grande and Jeanette McCurdy. The result was Schneider, ever the hands ever, ever the hands-on show showrunner, having to stop interacting with the series cast and stay in his office. Whoa. They literally, you can't even go talk to your cast and crew anymore. That's how bad it got. That eased any alleged toxicity on set while also keeping Schneider, the moneymaker, in the Nickelodeon tent, where he created two more shows, Game Shakers and Henry Danger. Until 2017 and Hollywood's reckoning with hostile workplaces and SH and a accusations against Harvey Weinstein and others, a lot of rumors were circulating around Dan Schneider. And there and these really exploded online. Business insider writer Kate Taylor tells the series in the fourth episode and a second internal investigation by Nickelodeon while clearing Schneider of any hint of S misconduct led to his exit in 2018. It did find the evidence of being ABUSIVE to others in the workplace, Taylor reports, and the network changed the locks at the Nickelodeon on Sunset facility where Schneider ran his empire. Let's Oh, here, here I am, I guess. Let's collectively please not let another Dan happen. He cannot happen again. This is not a joke. Alexa Nicholas, a Zoe 101 cast member, tells the series. This is Kate Taylor, by the way. She's the one who wrote that incredible expose, um, just exposing Dan Schneider. And um, yeah, really round of applause. And, and she's also part of the documentary, obviously. So just so incredible, incredible. Person. So Schneider shared the following statement with the docu series, which airs at the end of the four parter. 
Everything that happened on the shows I ran was carefully scrutinized by dozens of involved adults. All stories, dialogue, costumes, and makeup were fully approved by network executives on two coasts. A standards and practices group read and ultimately approved every script and programming executives reviewed and approved all episodes. In addition, ding, 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 ding. Every day on set, there were always parents and caregivers and their friends watching us rehearse and film. Cool, Dan. So you're just letting us know that Nickelodeon was okay with your horrific behavior. Thanks. So that's why I'm going to go protest Nickelodeon, by the way. Dan Schneider said it himself. He's like, listen. These were the people that were letting me do it. Right? They approved of all of it. The safe haven for Dan Schneider. He's like, look over there. He doesn't want to take really, honestly, true accountability when it comes to his actions. He wants everyone to look over there. And we will. We will look over there. Because it's very important for us to. To look at how institutions cover up and don't care about human life. Because they're in it for the money. Nickelodeon is a corporate entity. It is not a person, does not have a face. It's a company. It's a corporation. And like all corporations, they don't care about people for the most part. And we're talking about the big guys, you know, like the big ones. Like Nickelodeon. Like Viacom. You know, these billion dollar corporations. They're in it for the ad revenue. It's all about ad revenue and capitalism. That's all it's about. And they get to have kids sit. Now it's different with streaming, right? But back when I was younger, you were like watching these commercials for the most part in between these TV shows that you loved or whatever. And it was brooming you into capitalism, consumerism. Want this toy, get this toy, this Go-Gurt, this, 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 this. Nickelodeon cares more about who is putting down for ad revenue than any of the children on their show. Hands down. A go slap, though. The go were really good, yeah. I was actually in a go commercial. For frozen? Frozen? I haven't never had a Frozen. Was it good? Wait, are you serious? No, I've never had a Frozen. Dude, Frozen go was crazy. It would, like, crystallize in this weird way. It, like... It was like frozen yogurt, yeah. But it was like, yeah, it would like do this like. Who else has had gogurt, by the way, in the chat? I want to know who else has frozen gogurt. That sounds kind of good. I always had one in my lunchbox when I was younger. But like, that's the thing, though, is that I, mean, you know, I wouldn't have honestly known about it if it wasn't for a commercial ad break. And so we must be mindful that these corporations will say whatever they can to get out of accountability to get out of any type of liability. Sorry, it's not even about accountability for them. They're just like, are they gonna sue us? <laughs> you know, we don't want litigation in our business model. That's all it's about for them. They didn't care about us. That's the truth. They don't care about any of us. They don't care about any of us. So we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna do some sliming um, on the 19th. We've got, we, were, we already started making the protest signs and Okay. Hi, Fizzer. Hi, Alexa. I'm a new subscriber from the UK, and I just wanted to leave you some genuine love and gratitude for all that you're doing. You're truly a voice for the voiceless. Thank you, Fiona. Hashtag me too. Fiona, thank you so much for being here. That was really, really sweet. I really appreciated that. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so, so much. Okay. So, so sweet. Okay. So let's go. Let's get into this. Where were we? Um, so Dan says Nickelodeon let him do it all. <laughs> um, that's followed at the end of the final episode with, and in response to producers' questions, Nickelodeon has stated it investigates all formal complaints as part of our commitment to fostering a safe and professional workplace. We have adopted numerous safeguards over the years, help ensure we are living up to our own high standards and the expectations of our audience. All right, Chad GBT. You see how it's all like very legal, like it's all to protect the company. The language is purposefully, a lawyer spent hours, probably days, meticulously putting that statement together. 
It's not coming from a heart. It's not a living, breathing person saying that statement. That's someone protecting the business. Separately, Nickelodeon released the following statement pertaining to the docuseries allegations. Though we cannot cooperate or negate allegations of behaviors from productions decades ago, Nickelodeon, as a matter of policy, investigates all formal complaints, blah, 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 blah. Got it, got it, got it. Our highest priorities are the well-being and best interest, not just of our employees, cast, and crew, but of all children. <laughs> and we have adopted... Then take it all off the air. All the ones that are extremely... Um, that have been exposed, I want then off the air. Put your money where your mouth is, by the way. If you really care about children and there's footage in there that is not okay for children, where children were exploited, you care about children, take it off then. Take it off. And how much are you you've been making? By the way, none of us have residuals. So Nickelodeon has built their empire off of the back of child labor. They keep making money, and they just left us in the dust. I'm going to try and get a hold of the contract, by the way, because I'm going to read the contract that Nickelodeon gave children to sign. Because in there, it is ridiculous. They basically are like, you don't get nothing. We just use you up and spit you out. And we're going to make billions of dollars off of you. Your show is going to be on Netflix streaming, bought here, there. We don't buy once you're done, you know, buy. I mean, around the world, too. The, and around the, the world, the base, right? Base, yeah, they make so much money selling syndication. Stuff. Yeah, selling the stuff around the world. Like, later. yes, like major money. And, and, you know, a lot of us can't, we barely can pay our rent. Barely pay rent. You know, and it's really, really sad. And they're just like sitting there with their lawyers and their chat GBT or whatever, and writing this statement from their, whatever, their castle. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> I don't buy it. I don't think you care about all children whatsoever. Um, we've adopted numerous safeguards, blah, 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 um, to our own high standards and the expectations of our audience. Oh, shit, there they are again. The ones who wrote the letters. <laughs> um... Ooh, so how I want to just check in with the chat here. How how is everyone feeling? What what what's the feeling when it comes to you know everything? How 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 are people feeling about Dan Schneider? Oh yeah, maybe I should also say this. Look at what look what we created. So so I don't know if anyone's watched the first protest, but I I'm I basically go down a line and like you know it was a slime time live. <laughs> And we're going to do another Slime Time Live this year, and it's going to be even better, honestly. But we're going to have an ad break in the middle of it. So I want to show you guys what, uh, what the ad break is going to be uh, during our live streaming protest. <laughs> Remember? Remember Mr. Pizzagate? Well, since they were so worried about... <laughs> Um, Pizzagate more than um, the victim, uh, in my opinion here. I uh, I made it simple. <laughs> I made it real, real simple. And we got the chef in the middle. Um, and we got Pod Meets Pizzagate. So that'll be our ad um, break. And it will be sponsored by uh, I Fart Radio. And we're really looking forward to um, cashing in on that. <laughs> on our ad break here. <laughs> Sorry, had to be done. And listen, enablers need to be held accountable, right? And survivors have every right to have a feeling when it comes to their actions and how they're choosing to make it right. And that definitely was not it. That was definitely not what my mom say. I read yesterday... They pulled Dan's shows. Don't know if it's true. Well, apparently they've said this before. I guess apparently they like tweeted when the accusations came out against Drake Bell and they said they weren't going to be running Drake Bell. And it's like, really? I mean, Drake, but they're going to um, run Drake and Josh. And you're like, really? And then I guess apparently two weeks later or something, they were doing a marathon. A marathon. Of Drake and Josh. And so, you know, Nickelodeon, and then they sold it to Netflix. So 
let's not take their word for it. You know, Nickelodeon, I don't know if they're necessarily the uh, Queen Jaden laughing. <laughs> um, I fart is brilliant. Thanks, Lily. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. I'm so excited for this protest um, to just once again stand in front of that building and, you know, protest it protest it and now we have so many reasons why we're protesting obviously it's grown it's now many voices have come forward about how they were treated at Nickelodeon and I want to make sure that every future kid uh, that goes in there working there um, is safe and valued not exploited and not actualized none of it right we have to make sure that that is the future because it's freaking horrible. It's horrible. Fight for all survivors. And what else do we got going on? Oh, so then tomorrow also we're going to be doing hard feelings. Chef's Kiss is back. Um, so we'll be doing hard feelings tomorrow with anyone who is a member um, of Chef's Kiss. So we're listening to Jeanette McCurdy's podcast, Hard Feelings, reflecting on our own hard feelings. And I'm really looking forward to being back um and doing that it's been a while it's been honestly a little bit too long and i just want to remind everyone here that we don't have any sponsors for this show and so this is community built and ways to support um survivor centric youtube creator is liking this video please or sharing it with a, a fellow survivor or an ally and just you know spreading the word um, and also, you know, we have a Patreon that really helps for the protests and we are, we're creating a crazy surprise for the protests, by the way. Oh, oh, insane surprise. You guys are gonna be like, what is happening? It, we're really excited about it. And so the Patreon really helps for the protesting. It helps really to keep this going. I've dedicated my whole life honestly to this work and so you know it's uh it's 100 percent community built and so we have the patreon so please if you can um we have a couple different tiers with different perks um and it'd be so 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 appreciated we also have all of the the merch which for me personally oh, we still have the e-predators academy we really got it miko and i we haven't we haven't taken down a lot of things that are not even supposed to be there anymore this shouldn't be there anymore so get it if you want it we got e-predators academy and the power to survivor sweaters and t-shirts and um yeah so that those are ways those are ways and please subscribe turn your notifications on um and I really, really appreciate this community. And you guys are all so awesome. And I will see Chef's Kiss on Friday. Be back on Tuesday. Oh, wait, no. I'm, oh, by the way, I'm coming back Monday. So month, so the, the show airs on a Sunday. And I will be going live on Monday. So I'll be in the studio on Monday for a recap of the first two episodes that air. And so please be there with me as I go through all of the motions and we can discuss it and digest. And so I'll actually see you all on Monday. Thank you so, so much. And I'll see you then.